everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Running a little bit late because the prayer breakfast ran over uh, earlier this morning. As you know, we gathered for the National Prayer Breakfast, a time-honored tradition to gather in faith, fellowship, and humility, as well as prayer. The values expressed by many people at the prayers breakfast as they led us in prayer were in stark contrast with the president's unconstitutional, immoral, and dangerous ban on refugees and citizens of Muslim countries coming into the United States. The president claims this is about security, but national security experts are urgently speaking out. The president's cruel and reckless ban makes America less safe. 900, over 900 American diplomats have risked their careers to send the message that the president's ban makes America less safe. Again, <coughs> protecting our nation, and that's our first responsibility, to protect and defend our Constitution <coughs> and the American people, requires us to be smart and strong, not reckless and rash. Three times, House Republicans have blocked Democrats' emergency bill uh, to rescind the ban. It's called the Statute of Liberty Values Act. We are continuing to explore all of our legislative and legal options to overturn this dangerous ban. What's making America less safe is to have a white supremacist named to the National Security Council as a permanent member, while the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the director of national intelligence are told, uh, don't call us, we'll call you. You're no longer permanent members, we'll call you when we need whatever judgment they make about when they want them to come back. This is, it's a stunning thing that a white supremacist, Bannon, would be a permanent member of National Security Council and dismissing <coughs> Chairman of Joint Chiefs and the Director of National Security, excuse me, National Intelligence as permanent members. You probably are aware of this, but I, I found it intriguing that House, House Oversight Committee Chairman John Chavitz told the Washington Post that he was weighing legislation that in essence says if you're going to have your hands on the nuclear codes, you probably, we should probably know what mental state you're in. I can't wait until he introduces that legislation to be able to join in as <laughs> co-sponsor of that, as Mr. Cummings has also said. I think it's a very good idea. I think it's a very good idea. Again, the public <coughs> outcry toward the president's dangerous ban over the weekend was massive, uh, and the president is clearly eager to sh sh shift attention away. You notice that every time something gets hot, he changes the subject. He changes the subject. He's an illusionist. If you, if you see, now you see it, now you don't. So when the heat was turned up by people turning out at airports throughout the country, probably surprised him, he decided to move up his announcement of his Supreme Court justice from Thursday to Tuesday. So on Tuesday night, the president announced his pick with Supreme Court, Judge Gorsuch, of course, he is far outside the mainstream of American judicial thought. In terms of women's rights, women's rights and Hobby Lobby, the judge singled out women's health for discrimination and enabled employers to meddle into work, their workers' most intimate reproductive health decisions. When it came to workers and consumers as a judge and in private practice, he, was consi he consistently sided with powerful corporate interest against consumers. If you care about clean air, clean water, food safety, safety of medicine, workers' rights, shareholders' rights, class action suits against fraud in the securities industry, if you care about the enforcement with the values of the IDEA, of uh, addressing the concerns of children with disabilities, and saying, in his case, children with autism should not have access to the same opportunities to reach their intellectual and personal uh, best. This is what he has chosen. Elections have ramifications. He also, uh, uh, re you all recall what a triumph the marriage equality decision was in the courts. Uh, that took action going through the courts, and he has criticized the progressives and condemned those who have turned to the courts to advance LGBT <coughs> Equality, But again, elections have ramifications, and as he has said, the president has said, far back as June, he saw a list of people <coughs> who met the standard 
for uh, the far right for issues that relate to a woman's right to choose, uh, marriage equality, and more. And um, uh, he made that commitment, which he honored in the worst possible way. Uh, Tuesday, that same day, uh, uh, that he made that announcement also marked the end of the open enrollment period uh, for the insurance marketplace under the Affordable Care Act. Um, by Christmas Eve, just to go back a few weeks, 11.5 million people were already signed up, outpacing the year before. <clears throat> California even extended the deadline for enforcement until February 4th to accommodate the large surge in enroll enrollment. You had to sign up, but you can complete your application in another few days. Republicans continue to try to create uncertainty and sabotage the marketplace. Um, last week, the Trump administration abruptly canceled much of the advertising and outreach to uh, uh, efforts that helped remind Americans that time was running out for them to complete their applications. It's, it's never, uh, uh, contrast this with, uh, you won't, many of you weren't here, but when Medicare Part D was debated in the Congress under the presidency of George, uh, President George W. Bush, we overwhelmingly opposed it. Overweight, so it was a giveaway to the pharmaceutical industry, and one of the reasons that our our, uh, our deficit was increased, our national debt was increased, take that from the Congressional Budget Office, not from me, because of the high cost uh, and the giveaways to the pharmaceutical companies. So we opposed it, but it became law, and our offices facilitated the opportunity for constituents to take advantage of it. Our responsibility is to our constituents. This is outrageous that they would say, we're not even going to let you know what the law allows you to do because we're philosophically opposed. It's just another example of they're not trying to make America great again. They're trying to make America sick again. And this will lead to suffering, death, disability. It's a tragedy. But we are going to make that fight. But in the meantime, the disruption to the marketplace, because this is a free, a marketplace-oriented event, uh, the exchanges and any additional uncertainty that is injected there by this administration just um, uh, it, it's not constructive and they want it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. See, we did this so it didn't work and therefore it didn't work not having anything to do with what we did. Make America sick again. Any questions? Let me see a new person. Okay, you. Uh, I'm like the old people. <laughs> have you had any conversations with GOP leaders about uh, the Obamacare replacement and possibly finding ways that Democrats could work with Republicans? No. None? We're waiting to see what they have to offer. Uh, the, um, the repeal and replace, as I said before, has alliteration, uh, but it doesn't really have the votes, and it, we haven't seen anything yet. The president says it's going to be beautiful, we're going to see it any minute, any second, any nanosecond, but we haven't seen anything yet. Uh, but uh, hopefully we will, and then we can act upon that, And uh, uh, but we haven't seen anything yet. In the meantime, what is happening across the country is members of Congress are hearing from their constituents, and it's one thing to pass a bill and say, this will be good for you. It's another thing to say, we're taking this away from you. And I think that uh, some of their uh, vocabulary is changing on the subject. Uh, you're using words like rebuild or those kinds of words rather than you'll hear less and less of uh, repeal. Uh, that's a, of a Tea Party uh, orientation, but not really what we think will happen. The other part of it is people are seeing the connection between the Affordable Care Act, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, and in the Affordable Care Act, we prolong the life of Medicare. We provide additional benefits to seniors for free uh, uh, exams uh, that has helped them be healthier, uh, intervening sooner, uh, closing the donut hole. That means lowering the cost of their prescription drugs. And if you repeal that, uh, and again, prolonging the life of Medicare for 10 years of more of solvency. If you repeal that, you seriously undermine Medicare. At the same time, in their budget, they want to turn Medicare into a uh, voucher. In other words, remove the guarantee. Medicare is a guarantee. You remove the guarantee, you remove Medicare. And then in terms of Medicaid, which is a very important part of this, people think of it in, in, a, in the good way that it is about helping poor children and, their, and working parents and the rest, and that's a good thing, but uh, probably 
a large number of children take care of it, probably one-fifth of the money is spent on children because a large amount of money is spent on seniors. Half the dollars spent in nursing homes are Medicaid dollars. This is for middle-income families who have spent down their assets and now qualify for Medicaid, and they're in these hospitals. You can also, in case you have grandparents who fall into this category, you can also have a daycare. You can drop off your uh, elderly parents or grandparents for daycare under all of this. Uh, but, if, if, but what the Republicans want to do is block grant, shrink Medicaid. And that is, that is something that the Republican governors in many of the states are arguing against. So it's not just about poor children and their parents, it's not just about people with disabilities, however worthy that would be justification enough. It's about seniors. And it's also about opioids. Don't take it from me, the governor of Ohio has said, uh, thank God for Medicaid, because that's gonna help us address the opioid addiction. So again, I think the Tea Party probably <coughs> wants to get rid of Medicaid, but I think that that will be problematic in the, in the discussion. But the public has to understand what this means to them, not as public policy or their ideology about no role of government, but what it means to you and to your family uh, and, and uh, in terms of all of this. Now, I won't go into all of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, not only the 20 million people and growing who will now have access, who didn't have access before, but the over 150 million people who get their, uh, their uh, health insurance from their, in the workplace, who now have no existing pre-existing no pre condition being a barrier to, to insurance, no lifetime limits uh, or, or annual limits on their care. Uh, being a woman is no longer a pre-existing condition. Kids can stay on the policy until 26 years old. Insurance companies are required to spend 80% of the money they receive on health care uh, and, and meeting the needs of their policyholders and not advertising CEO pay growing and the rest of that. So there's a, a lot of merit in the Affordable Care Act of itself. It's being wedded to um, Medicare and Medicaid as it was in the legislation. Now the states, there are over like 111 member, Republican members who are in states that had expanded Medicaid and they're going to see something snatched away from their constituents. They need to know about that. Some of their governments are arguing, don't touch that. Yeah, well, teacher. Lucy, um, I want to ask you about the Trump administration's first national security operation overseas in Yemen. Mm -hmm. I know you get briefed on these things and you, yeah. you can't talk about classified right. material, but based on what you know about the operation, are you satisfied with sort of how, what happened in the green light to go ahead with the raid, even though it's it did result in the death of an American soldier. Well, I, Deirdre, I have, uh, I'm looking for more information. The Department of Defense has put out a pretty thorough uh, uh, after action review, which is what you do after some, what is the after action review on it. But I haven't been um, briefed directly on it with questions that I may have, and I look forward to that. So I, I don't want to say anything about that right now, except to be sad about the loss of life that happened there and to say that intelligence matters in terms of actions taken, timing, and the rest of that. You have to be ready. Do you get the sense that they weren't ready? That I don't know. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm looking to see. Yes, Chad. Thank okay. you. Um, I know on opening day or the inauguration day, you and the other congressional leaders were with President Trump uh, in the, uh, on the, over on the Senate side thing. Uh, right. there. And one thing I noticed is everyone seemed to be cheery and optimistic and things. And in the past 14 days, can you kind of describe, and you went through a number of policy areas, ideological <clears throat> areas, Steve Bannon, yeah. how has your crest fallen over those 14 days? And is there something specific that is where you're the most disappointed in this press? Well, it isn't a question of crest falling. My crest <clears throat> fell on election day, uh, but you're ever hopeful. Uh, I don't have great expectations from what I have heard, uh, but that day was a matter of courtesy. A peaceful exchange of power is a question of courtesy. It wasn't anything jovial or lighthearted about it. It was a question of courtesy. Please don't mistake courtesy for approval or anything else positive. The next day, uh, well, it's less crisp on when on January 20th, we had the peaceful transfer of power with, with the inauguration of a new president. 
The next day, we had the peaceful show of power with millions of women, men, and families turning out across our country and across the world to say, here we are, we're paying attention, and we have concerns. Many of them marched to protect our care. So I was, I was very happy about that, but they had other issues as well. It was organic, it was spontaneous, it wasn't organized by any elected officials or, or political party. It was the people turning out. I thank them for that show, that show of we are listening, we are watching, look at us. But also, I think that that led to people showing up at the airports last weekend. They saw their power, they knew their power, and they said, okay, we'll show up again. Thousands of people across the country and into airports that really didn't have some of the challenges that we had, for example, in San Francisco, LaGuardia, I mean, uh, Kennedy and other places. So, uh, so that was, that is where you're less crestfallen. And then, of course, on the steps of the Supreme Court, we just had, we're having a press conference and thousands of people showed up there. So I think that uh, you, uh, you've heard me say it over and over. President Lincoln said, Pre public sentiment is everything. And the more the public shows that they are aware of what is happening, the more they hold us all accountable, Democrats and Republicans alike. This isn't political. It's about America. It's about a patriotic duty to, uh, to be informed and to weigh in and hold uh, people accountable uh, whose decisions affect uh, their lives. So that is what lifted my spirits, the, the Women's March, and certainly not the inauguration. Yes, uh, regarding Rex Tillerson, are you concerned now that he's been uh, confirmed that they'll be uh, moved by the White House or the State Department to lift sanctions on Russia? Well, I would be concerned about it. I don't know. I mean, they, the, what the president has to understand is that when you're president of the United States, your words weigh a ton. So even with your administration putting out, we're going to review that, is really staggeringly dangerous. Uh, because the, the sanctions on Russia, because of their uh, aggressive military behavior, are very important to our, our allies in Europe and to global security. I've visited uh, Ukraine, I've visited the countries and talked to members of the EU about this, and this would so seriously undermine our NATO alliance as well if, if uh, uh, these, these uh, sanctions have to be uh, multilateral and, and they're hurtful, especially to the Europeans, who uh, have proximity, but the fact is they're necessary. So there should be no doubt in anyone's mind as to where we are on the sanctions. They're not, they, somebody said, what was the statement they said? If they reduce their nuclear uh, arsenal, then we'll lift the sanctions. Sanctions have nothing to do with their nuclear <coughs> arsenal. They have to do with their military aggression. And that's where the relationship is. So I'm concerned about it, but uh, I've said, as I've said before, I'm more concerned about what do the Russians have on Donald Trump that he's all of a sudden flirting with the idea that he might lift those sanctions. Has there been any discussion of legislation uh, to codify the sanctions? At least on the House side, I know, I know that there's been discussion on the Senate side. I, I, I don't know of any. Uh, the, the, the sanctions exist. I, I, I don't think there should be any doubt as to uh, whether they will be enforced. That has to, the president has to make that clear. He has to make that clear. Otherwise, uh, uh, Putin will be laughing all the way to the bank <clears throat> and also uh, to the military front. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, non-disclosure agreements and whether you believe it's appropriate for congressional staffers who are paid by the American taxpayer to sign them to work with the administration. question is about non-disclosure agreements, in case you didn't hear that. No, I don't think it is appropriate at all. And what bothers me, uh, it, uh, in addition to that, is that non-disclosure agreements on the part of the administration with members of the staff of the House of Representatives is a serious separation of power issue, A. B, as a, a, it's in keeping with a non-transparency attitude of the administration, where they're saying no tweets from the uh, EPA and other places. Uh, and, um, jeopardizing the rights of whistleblowers in our, in our, uh, in our system. And so uh, transparency is a very important value that, that is, uh, produces better results 
for the American people, and what they're doing is shutting down. In fact, they want to shut you down. And I think that our, our press, that freedom of the press, is their biggest guardian of our democracy. And you see this being uh, heralded around the world as a, a, a concern that other journalists have in other countries, uh, that uh, nationalist governments coming in there might have the same attitude. So we're all in this together about openness in government, transparency in what we do. And uh, th this uh, non-disclosure is just another manifestation of their uh, suppressing uh, information. I've had conversations with uh, our ranking member on the committee, Mr. Conyers. They're, they're having a hearing today. I don't know that it's, on, it's not on this subject, but it may be brought up there. But uh, we definitely cannot ignore what has happened there. Can I ask you um, something that you just said? You mentioned the vocabulary changed by the yeah. Republicans coming about the health care. Um, a lot of discussion over this use of repair. They are pushing back the Republicans and saying that's uh, directed at the health care system, not the health care law. Oh. Do you buy that explanation? <laughs> well, the health care system is what it is, and, and the legislation. If we had no health care system, we probably would have had a single payer with community health centers all over the country as the bulk of, uh, of delivery of service to our people. But we do have a health care system. And um, uh, in some of the legislation and some of the provisions of the Affordable Care Act, we attempted to affect behavior, behavior of how, how doctors charge, behavior how safety uh, in hospitals is, uh, is protected, and, and uh, how we address uh, disparities among minorities, how we address culturally appropriate uh, approaches to health care, but also uh, how we um, rely more on technology in terms of, of uh, electronic medical records and the rest of that. So the legislation, in order to honor our three pillars, of, of our three goals, which were to expand coverage, which we have done, by 20 million at least people to and improve benefits, which we have done for everyone in our country, including the 155 million who get their coverage through the through the uh, workplace, and third, uh, to a lower cost. In all of these areas, we have been successful. We need to be more successful in lowering cost uh, because well, we have to address the prescription drugs, which are the biggest increase in in uh, uh, our care, but the rate of growth of health care in our country is the lowest in the 50 years they have been measuring it. So uh, certainly as you, uh, as you expand, improve, and lower cost, you're addressing uh, some of the systems of our health care. I named just a few, but the bill is fraught with things uh, that improve. It's value, not volume. That, that's one of the important uh, principles of the Affordable Care Act. Value. What? It, what is a procedure? It's. It's. Um, uh, it's not about procedures. It's about progress in the health of the person. So, uh, in other words, if you live in a place where you a person goes in and they receive care, but the care is not as valued based as it should, and they're dismissed, and then they come back, readmittances caused a great deal of the cost, increased the great deal of the cost. So the bill, again, has as one of its um, priorities, value, not volume of services, progress, not proceed, a number of procedures. So that's really written into the bill. If they have any good ideas, we'd love to hear them. They've had seven years to come up with it, and so far we hear vocabulary changes and the rest. But hopefully we can find some common ground uh, to go forward. But we will stand our ground to protect the Affordable Care Act because we believe it is a right Health care is a right for everyone, not just a privilege for the few. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.